Hi guys, welcome to today is Tuesday, October 18th and we are in week 10. We're planning for an exam next week. You guys still have the review. The exam is gonna be on the 27th, which is not this Thursday, next Thursday. So hopefully you guys are uh, still doing the review. The exam will focus mainly on the solar system. So hopefully you guys are uh, actually, uh, uh, you, you did all of the preparations and everything are in order. The other item also of this week that is important is the fact that we have our, uh, we did actually our last observation for the lunar project. So by now I expect that most of you are uh, basically putting the project together. If you have any questions, please let me know. I don't want you really to be stuck on that project. So I wanna make sure that you guys are uh, uh, moving along uh, smoothly. I know some of the questions probably are a little bit kind of uh, confusing. So uh, make sure that everything is clear. I know I ask, for example, for shape or sometimes by how it looks like and things like that. So there are things that need to be technical in the sense that uh, what are the names of the phases and also a description of things like that. So, and the date and the time and the position also, in a sense that when we ask for position, if you guys remember the instructions was not to really be a, uh, how should I put it, a, uh, uh, as long as it's a kind of a descriptive position, north, south, east, west, uh, uh, above the horizon, or uh, I mean, near the zenith or uh, just above the horizon or somewhere in between. So that's basically some of the stuff I quickly, but again, for your own specific project, if you're running to a difficulty, please let me know. Granted, the project is not due until after the exam. So uh, make sure that you do the exam first because the exams carry a lot of weight in them. And then also don't forget that you have a project that is due. Sounds good guys. Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you, Samantha. So uh, in terms of this week content, we're still dealing with the uh, concept of uh, light really and how light is, uh, uh, and because it's really, we're, we're moving toward the stars. We want to understand the stars. And stars or even planets, usually spectroscopy, which is the study of the spectrum, different kind of lines of, uh, of, of, of light, if you wish, is, uh, is a very helpful tool. Granted for planets, they reflect light, they don't produce light, just like the moon and the earth. The earth does not emit light. Same thing with the moon, they reflect light. But one way of uh, reflection, and that's some of the things that we're gonna be exploring in here is that light when it's absorbed by material, it's not always reflected in the same wavelength. So we really need to understand what light is. So we need to have dig deep into the light, try to see its different components. Well, there are two kinds of light that you guys uh, are familiar with. <clears throat> there is a specific color of light, whether it's blue, green, yellow, red, whatever that is. And there are two other kinds, which are I'm going to put them together, one kind, uh, which is uh, the white color and the black color. Okay. The white color is actually the combination of all of the visible lights put together. So the white color is not a real color. Okay. White color is an addition of all of these frequencies together. They give us the appearance, or at least the brain interprets it as being white color. Okay. And then on the other side, there is colors that we don't see, or light that we don't see, frequencies that we don't see. That for the eye is completely uh, unaware of its existence, so it's going to show that there is no light. Okay, in the case of uh, truly there is no light being emitted, the object will appear black. In the case where the object is emitting frequencies, but those frequencies fall below a certain threshold, namely the infrared, or uh, above a certain threshold, namely the ultraviolet, anywhere of these two ranges outside of the this this basically in between the infrared basically the red and in between the uh, ultraviolet namely the violet that is what the eye is sensitive to that's how we have evolved here on planet earth and it may be correlated to how the sun behaves the sun emits 
light mainly in the visible region. So that's probably there is a correlation between how our eyesight evolved over time and with the with the frequency with the light that is emitted from the sun. So this is basically uh, uh, some of the properties, the main ones in here in terms of, uh, of light. So let me uh, share with you the uh, screen. Share unit 22. There are three units, I think, this week. So let me see exactly how many before I give you. Uh, uh, okay. So yeah, there are three units this week. So we're gonna be covering at least a unit, maybe more today. And the unit today is basically uh, some of the properties of light. The two main properties of light are frequency and wavelength, okay? And these are related to the behavior of light in time and space. So space is how light behaves. It behaves as, as a, a sine wave. Really. And uh, the, the separation between two peaks, for example, so this is how the sine wave would look like, basically. This behavior is both in time and space. It's the same behavior. If you take a peak in here and you go and find the next peak, the separation between them in wavelength, I mean, in time and space is called the wavelength. Wavelength. And the symbol for wavelength that you might encounter in the literature is the Greek letter lambda. So, if in case you're reading or people are talking about it and they throw in the symbol lambda for the, for the wavelength, that is what they're referring to. It's basically take two peaks, two successive peaks, because you might be wondering what happened in here between this peak and this peak. They're not successive. There is a peak in between them. So you have to go two successive peaks. The distance in them between them is what is known as wavelength. And a wavelength is a measure of distance, really. So wavelength is actually in units of the distance, which is a meter. That's how you measure distance in uh, uh, the standard system, basically, of measurements that is used by scientists. So how many meters that is? Or how many fractions of a meter that is? Or how many kilometers that is? So that's basically the separation between peak and peak. Uh, you might think that, OK, by symmetry, since this is kind of a sine wave, could it be the separation between uh, trough and trough? Yes, it's the same thing. Trough is the low, basically, end of the uh, wavelength. Yeah, it's the same thing. That should be the same distance. As a matter of fact, any two similar points, successive points, are uh, uh, constitute a wavelength. OK, here is where it crosses, for example. The, uh, the, here is where the wave vanishes. There are two places where it vanishes. It vanishes here here and here, there are three places. But you have to be in consistent. In here, it's coming from negative to positive, and in here, from positive to negative. So that's not a wavelength. As a matter of fact, that's a half wavelength. So in here, it's coming from negative to positive. So it's from negative to positive when it vanishes to the negative to positive when it vanishes. So in this case, the wave is zero, the wave is zero. That too is a wavelength. So that's to give you an idea, but it's easy to remember from peak to peak than, than any of the other small details, okay? So this is what a wavelength is, and it's from the side wave behavior. Now, in terms of frequency, frequency is related to a, uh, I tend to write on the uh, screen, because uh, my screen is kind of sensitive, that's why it's kind of uh, jumping. So anyway, so the frequency, it's behavior in time now, okay? So the separation between two consecutive peaks in time, namely one peak and the wavelength drops and then comes back and another peak, okay? But we are in the same place. So in this case, it's a, it's, it's a period. So this distance is the period in time. So it's a time now. 
So it's a, it's a time which is measured in seconds. So the units per time is measured in the standard system of measurements. So you wait, you have a peak, and you wait for the next peak. That is a period. The frequency is related to the period. The frequency is just the inverse of the period. Okay. I think the book uses the Greek letter nu for <coughs> excuse me for the frequency. So either you see it as the Greek letter nu or the commonly also use the letter F for frequency. Frequency. So frequency is related to period, and the period is T. So this is basically some of the definitions that you have. So if you have never taken any kind of study of waves, this is common to all waves. It's not just true for the case of the light. It's true for all waves. So this is actually general behavior. And uh, 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 like, for example, sound also has a frequency. So, and it's called pitch for sound, okay? But it's still frequency and also has a, 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 a wavelength. And the wavelength usually is denoted by the letter lambda. So that's sound. Water waves also have frequency and have also wavelength. You go to the ocean and you see the water waves forming basically on the on the surface of the water or of the ocean, you will see that there are peaks. If you take a picture of it, take a camera and snap a picture of it. Okay. And if you know the scale of the picture to how real it is, you can actually measure the distance between two consecutive peaks. And that is your wavelength. So it's a frozen event in time and only changes the space. So that is the wavelength lambda for the case of water. If you are on the ocean though, let's say for example, you're surfing and you decided to stop somewhere waiting for the waves to come along. So if you're stopping on the surface, what you're gonna do, you're gonna bob, you're gonna go down and up, down and up. The water, actually the wave is coming through and all of that, but you're not going anywhere. If you are basically not swimming and you don't have, if you don't have a motorized, for example, a boat or anything like that, so you're going to experience the water lowering down all the way to the bottom and then rising. And the time it takes you to go from the top down and then up again to the top, that is actually a period. How many times would you go up and down in one second? That is what the frequency is. Okay, so it's really, really an interesting thing. Now, this is where the part gets interesting. The wavelength and the frequency are related to the wave speed. So if the speed the wave is moving with a speed v, the wavelength times the frequency is the speed. For the case of light, that's the speed of light. For the case of sound, that's the speed of sound. For the case of uh, surface water, that's the speed of the waves on the water, on the surface of water, okay? But for the case of light, since we're doing light, this is the speed of light. So that is what the relationship between the two, meaning if, because the light goes with the same speed regardless of what color it is. It's always going with 300,000 kilometers or 300 million meters per second. So this is a fixed number. That means is if the wavelength is long, the frequency is low. So that you can multiply the two, you said that you have to have 300 million meters per second, no matter which way you do it. Now, if the wavelength is short, so let me get a different color in here. If you can get a different color, where is the market? Difference? I don't know how to get a different color on this thing in here. Anyway, not draw. That's what I'm doing. Sorry. So let me get a pen in here. That's a different color. Anyway, so if if the wavelength is short, the frequency is high. High and short versus 
when it's symmetric actually with the blue now versus when the when the wavelength is long oh this is a strange color anyway this is sorry <laughs> i didn't mean to do this coloring stuff the the frequency is uh, low this is basically what you need to know okay now light is made up of tiny particles this is according to the theory of mr uh, einstein and this the these particles are called photons and there is a reason for why they were called photons okay you guys have uh, 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 photo cells in your house, or if you know somebody who does, or you drive by and you see them, this they use light hitting the, the photo cell and extracting an electron off of them. So light in this case is made up of tiny particles that hit the surface of the, the, the metal there, pushing the electron, which is grabbed later on, and now you have a voltage that is created because when the electron is left the metal, the left the metal is left now with a positive charge, and the electron now is sitting in the opposite direction, and now you have created a battery. And if you complete the circuit, now you have actually current. So that is the principle behind it. So light now, light for this particular case is behaving like particle. It's like a tennis ball heavy, or uh, I'm sorry, it's like a uh, uh, billiard ball hitting another billiard ball. So think of the electron, for example, as being the uh, the uh, a colored ball, and the photon is being or the particle of light is being the white ball, the white uh, ball. So uh, and it comes in and hits it. Now the uh, the colored one or the striped one will uh, will, will be ejected. Removed. So this is basically how light is behaving as particles now. And these particles have wavelength, which is kind of a nonsense, I mean, in a classical sense, because we were used to a clear distinction between waves and particles. Our word, if a particle is a particle, it never mixes to become two different, two different to become one big particle. So if you have a rock, for example, or another rock, and you bring them closer to one another, they stay on two separate rocks, although touching one another. Okay, but for the case of waves, let me get back into the normal color. But for the case of waves, I can bring the wave in here, and I add to it another wave in here, and the resultant wave is a big wave. So it's a different. It's it's kind of a wave. It's the same wave. It has probably different frequencies depending on the frequency of the two components, but it's an entity by itself, which is a wave. And like rocks, if I have a rock in here, and I take another rock in here and bring them together, no matter how much I do, I will just have two separate rocks basically touching one another. So this is how particles behave versus how waves behave. Light has both. Light behaves in both. Light can be a wave, not can be, it is a wave. I just described its wavelength and frequency, and that is a wave. But also from the photoelectric effect, it must be also a particle, which is this duality that is sometimes kind of confusing on our level, on our basically macroscopic level, but on the microscopic level, there is no problem. You can have this nonsense existing together. These two contradictory concepts existing in the same thing. Okay, so uh, photons carry energy, and I just explained the fact that, that we can get energy from the from the photocells. Okay, so they carry energy when they hit a, a, a metal, for example, they can extract electrons. They don't necessarily need to extract electrons; they could just bump it to the next energy level, so the atoms can get excited. So you don't have to have completely ionized the atom like in the case of the photocell, but you could just have excited uh, atom. Once the atom is excited, usually it has tendency to go back to its ground state and by emitting the light that it has absorbed, okay? And that is how typically uh, materials behave actually with light. They interact with light in this way. So again, explain what color and white light correspond to in terms of wavelength 
wavelengths of lights. Okay, I just mentioned that the white color and uh, white color is just a combination of a bunch of other colors. Here is the terminology used in here. A specific color is called a monochromatic light. A mono means a single chromatic color, single color light. Okay, it doesn't matter if it's a blue, green, yellow, and there's different versions, for example, of the green. So it's not all of the green are the same. So each and every one of the versions of the green has a different wavelength. And uh, the combination of all of these colors will give you white light. So white light is not a monochromatic light. White light is not a monochromatic light. So if you have a laser, and I don't know where my laser is, if you have a laser, that is actually a monochromatic light. If you have a red laser, it's a monochromatic light. A green laser, it's a monochromatic light. But a, uh, the combination of all of the colors will give you a white light. And then name the different bands of light and order them by wavelength. Okay. So we're going to go from the shortest wavelength to the longest wavelength. The shortest wavelengths, remember from this analogy here, have high frequencies. Short wavelength, high frequency. The shortest wavelengths that are known, and nothing is shorter than they are, are the gamma rays. The gamma rays are so high frequency that you cannot even imagine how much frequency it is. They are extreme high energy. That's another word in here about the energy. I know we probably we forgot to mention it when I was talking about the photons. The higher the frequency, the higher the energy. Meaning, a red light is less energetic than a blue light, which is less energetic than a violet light. So there is more energy, for example, with the violet than that with the blue, than that with the, uh, and the blue is higher than the green, and the green is higher than the yellow, and the yellow is higher than the orange, and the orange is higher than the red. So this is basically how energy is related to frequency or uh, related to wavelength. So the shortest wavelength is the gamma rays, which are extremely, extremely dangerous rays, okay? And they usually are produced in a very, very, very energetic events in the universe, such as, for example, the collision of uh, black holes or neutron stars or inside a big explosion, for example, in a supernova or something like that. So gamma rays or gamma ray bursts are known to be one, some of the violent, violent events in the universe. Okay, So these are, number one, extremely short. Then the next one in, 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 I mean, slightly longer in wavelength, slightly lower in frequency, but still dangerous are the X-rays. X-rays are the next level in terms of also uh, wavelengths, okay? And they are actually extremely dangerous too. You don't want to be too exposed to them. I know when you go into a chest X-ray or any X-ray, for example, for an injury, you get exposed to the X radiations. Well, X-ray radiation. That is usually controlled in a very short burst of radiation. And usually it's uh, it's 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 also pointed to a specific location and it has some medical applications that is necessary. So this is X-rays. Then comes after that a little longer wavelength, but it's still very short wavelength, uh, namely the, the ultraviolet. So the ultraviolet radiation also is very, very highly damaging. I mean, it could cause cancer. It, it, actually, it will, it will kill most organisms. So if there is a, an extended exposure to ultraviolet radiation, uh, it, it really could decimate life. And it is used as one of the system, uh, sanitation, sanitization, basically, it's a mechanism in the hospitals, actually, if before going into a surgery or something, or you can use that except that you don't want to be exposed to them, okay? Potentially you could. The point in here is they're extremely highly energetic and they're usually actually used to kill uh, uh, organic matter, life in general. Now, luckily on Earth, we have the ozone layer because the sun produces ultraviolet also. We have the ozone layer that absorbs the ultraviolet radiation, okay? So we are to some extent protected as long as we have this ozone layer. 
So that is the next energy level. Then comes the visible light. The visible light, which is the entire thing from the violet all the way to the red, is a very, very narrow, narrow band. So in a sense, the wavelength is kind of long, relatively speaking, with respect to the others. So we're going to come to the numbers, OK? Just to give you an idea, usually, uh, for the case of light, it's several hundred nanometers, anywhere between 300 or 400 to 700 nanometer. So what is a nano? Again, it's 10 to the negative 9 meters. So this number is a very, very small number. It's 0 0.000. So this is three zeros, three more zeros, and another zero and a four meter. So think of a meter and divide it into 40, into four, 40 million pieces. Each piece corresponds to a wavelength of the, uh, of the uh, blue light or violet light. And here is the red. Okay, the red actually is slightly uh, longer. Okay, instead of four, it's a seven, so it's slightly longer. So this is for the case of, of, of light. Then comes after that comes the, uh, the infrared. The infrared, which is shorter, I mean, uh, longer than the red, but in terms of frequency is less than the red. Uh, this is basically what heat is for the most of the time. And then comes after that, because the heat is associated with the motion of the molecules, so that's how it's produced, actually. Okay, and uh, after that comes the microwave region. I know you have probably, most likely, you have a microwave device in your home that it operates in that in that region, the microwave range. And microwave is actually used for technology also for the remote controls. It uses uh, those frequencies, the infrared or microwave uh, frequencies. And it's used extensively in those ranges. Those are still short wavelength for longer communications, but they're useful in the sense that the water molecules, for example, they get agitated and they start to move. And in doing so, they increase the temperature inside. That's why it's used in cooking. And then after that comes, of course, the radio waves. The radio waves are very, very wide range, and it's used in actually in telecommunications mainly at least in here on Earth, but it's actually also another one that is used to explore um, the far reaches of the universe, okay? So this is basically, in a nutshell, the entire unit. So let's discuss this briefly in here. So again, in astronomy, it is far too difficult to visit stars and most planets in person. Astronomers primarily use a uh, primary tool in learning is the electromagnetic radiation. Now, uh, there is a side note in here corresponding to this point. That's true, okay? Today, if you take a telescope, for example, and you're looking at the stars or the planets, that's what you're doing. You're using electromagnetic radiation because that's light. Or if you have a, a spectrometer attached to your telescope analyzing the light that is coming, it's still light. It's still electromagnetic radiation. Remember from the previous unit, we said that light is just the vibration of the electric field and the magnetic field. That's where the word electromagnetic radiation is. On a side note in here, there is a brand new technology that is basically, it's, it's way in its infancy, which is using gravitational waves. And this one is due to the LIGO project. If you guys have heard of it, this is actually extremely, extremely uh, brand new technology because it uses different wavelengths and it uses lasers uh, as they are uh, uh, laser beam basically on a very, very long ones on a 90 degree angle. And it collects light and it collects, it collects uh, gravi gravitational waves. And gravitational waves are not light. They're not really, they travel with the speed of light too but they're not lights. They are actually different kind of waves altogether. And it's actually the space and time that are actually fluctuating. Time itself is actually being stretched with space too. So uh, this is actually brand new technology. It's helping us, it's allowing us to actually uh, study uh, uh, the most violent events in the universe, basically like collision of two black holes or collision of a black hole and a neutron star or two neutron stars and things like that at this point. 
uh, and seeing the ripples of that one throughout space. At this point in here, that is what it allows us. Ultimately, in the, and down the road, we probably could uh, detect the gravitational waves for less violent events. But at this point, we don't have enough technology to explore those ones. Because the gravitational waves are produced by all kinds of other things too. So we are on a verge of a new astronomy. That's basically the point I'm trying to say in here. And this new astronomy uses a different technology altogether. And this is basically the new trend that we're headed to work. At this point, the only technology that we have uses light. So that's the only way for us to study stars. There is no other way. We don't. We can't send probes, for example, to anything. They're, they're too far, at least with our current technology. We're limited in that sense. So again, the colors we see are determined by the wavelength. And I described what the wavelength is from crest to crest. The consecutive crests, okay, successive crests, it's a key in this case, or traps if you like, which is the bottom and the bottom. Okay. It has to be successive also. This is what the wavelength is. This is some this is very similar to the concept of uh, distance between the crest and ocean. So it's the same idea. It's actually the, the same concept too. It's a wave whether we're talking about light or waves on the, on the surface. Of. And it usually has the Greek letter lambda. Okay. And then uh, I mentioned uh, the red is about 700 nanometers or seven times 10 to the negative seven meters. So you're going to write seven and then follow it by how many zeros is that? I'm sorry, we follow it with six zeros and a seven because the seventh digit is actually six, right? Okay. And then the violet is 400 nanometers. Again, 400 to 700 is typical. Uh, Visible light, okay. Colors between red and violet are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Okay. So uh, I don't know. Okay. So that's basically the the separation between the colors in that. Okay. Receptors in our eyes use different molecules that react to photons of different wavelengths leading to our perception of color. So what's going on? You're looking at an object, for example, the screen now is multicolored, unless you have a difficulty with seeing colors, which is a common uh, uh, problem with a lot of people that they can't see color. So what you see in this case is your eye has the light that is reflective off of, reflected off your screen from the yellow, and going straight to your eye, and the eye in this case will have a, a, a specific oscillation of the of the charges and here of the electrons in your eye and the retina of your eye, and that eye oscillation is sent an electrical signal to uh, through your uh, nerve brain, your nerve optical nerve. I'm sorry, to your brain where, where the brain interprets and tells you that is yellow. That's your interpretation of yellow. Your interpretation of yellow may or may not be the same as anybody else in the, in the world. Actually, it may be a word unique to yours, but we all call it yellow. Okay. Same thing with the red color that you see in there. Okay. The white one, as I was saying before in the intro, white is actually the combination of all the colors they are reflected. Okay. So that is how the eye works. Okay. The frequency is really you're sitting in the same spot and you go up and down, up and down. And how many times would you go that uh, per second? That is what the frequency is. It's per unit of time. So the, I know I wrote the uh, the earlier the frequency. I know they use the letter nu in this case in here, the Greek letter nu, which is fine. You can use the Greek letter nu. Frankly, I like the, the letter t better. Okay, but you're, you're you're you have the option. So if you are in exam and you label it differently than the book, you're fine as long as it's F or new. Okay. Uh, anyway, the unit for the frequency is the inverse of the unit of time, and the unit of time is a second. Okay. But in honor of Mr. Hertz, who did a lot of work in this area, uh, the unit was named after him. So one over second is actually a Hertz. And that's what you see actually on your on your on your phone, for example, and your cell phone. How many gigahertz is it? Is it 5.5 gigahertz? 
or is it six, uh, or is it what, 2.4 gigahertz? So those are some of the typical numbers we have. So what does that mean? Well, it, how long is this wavelength? That's a question, okay? <laughs> so let's think about it for a second. Remember I wrote earlier, the frequency times the wavelength is the speed of light. So the frequency times the wavelength is equal to three times 10 to the power eight meter per second. That's what 300 million is, okay? Where I just wrote five in here, let me just take five. I don't want to write the whole thing in here, okay? So let's write five gigahertz. Five gigahertz is five times 10 to the power nine hertz times the lambda is equal to three times 10 to the power eight. 10 to the power eight divided by 10 to the power nine, that is 10 to the power uh, 10 to the power one. So lambda is equal to three times 10 to the power eight divided by five times 10 to the power nine. That's what I'm saying in here. Cancel the eight and the nine, and it will be left with the one in the denominator. So the wavelength is 350th of a meter. Or multiply two by two. I mean, I know it's 0 0.6, so that's uh, 0.06, actually, if you do the calculator, meter. This is six centimeters. So your cell phone, your cell phone uses a wavelength of about six centimeters, slightly less, actually, than six centimeters, maybe five point something centimeters. And the other ones are actually, uh, 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 this one in here is longer. The old cell phones are actually longer the ones that use all technology, 2.4 gigahertz. So in your cell phone, this is mine. In your cell phone, what you have in this case is you have an antenna in here that is capable of capturing six centimeters. Six centimeters is what? About two and a half inches or slightly over two inches. So that is basically the length of the antenna. The length of the antenna should be about half that number. So the antenna that is in your cell phone should be about three centimeters. Three centimeters is about an inch, slightly over an inch, okay? So that's basically what we're talking about in here. And that's why your cell phone needs that antenna inside. So if you open the cell phone, I don't recommend it unless it's really a cell phone that you're not gonna use. So if you will find an antenna somewhere in the background in here, trying to capture the signal. So that's how you calculate things. So for the case of your cell phone, that's at the length of it. But for the case of light, for example, the number I gave is much, much shorter wavelength than the six centimeters. For the red light, for example, the wavelength is about, for red light, if you guys remember, is 700 nanometers or seven times 10 to the negative seven meters. So that's the case. I'm going to go back into this expression. Lambda, the wavelength, which is seven times negative seven times the frequency of the red is equal to three times 10 to the power eight. Now, if I do the division to find the frequency, it's three times 10 to the power eight divided by seven times 10 to the power negative eight, negative seven. Then in this case, I'm going to move to negative seven and change its sign. So it becomes a positive seven, seven and eight is 15. So that's 10 to the power 15 gigahertz. No, no, not gigahertz, I'm sorry, hertz, hertz, hertz. We're gonna find out exactly what kind of hertz is this. And then you have three over seven. Three over seven is what I'm going to quickly find this number in here. Three over seven. It's 0 0.42. So it's 4.2. Okay, let me, uh, this is 0 0.42 by the way, but because I have to write it in scientific notation, I'm going to move the decimal points to here and change this number to 14, okay? because I'm, I'm uh, uh, multiplying by this number and dividing by it. So it's 0 0.42, you multiply it by 10, it becomes 4.2. But since I multiplied by 10, I have to divide by 10. So instead of 10 to the power 15, it's gonna be 10 to the power 14 hertz. This is a ridiculous number compared to a phone that is five times 10 to the power nine hertz. So your phone is about a gigahertz. 
uh, the the light that that is striking your eye. Did I lose the thing? The light that strikes your eye has higher frequency than that of your cell phone. Okay. So this light that hits your eye has a frequency of the order of 10 to the power 14 Hertz. So just to give you an idea, divide that by 10 to the power nine Hertz. Uh, that's about 100,000 times more energetic. So the longest wave, meaning the lowest frequency that hits your eye, that you're subject to from the environment, is 100,000 times more energetic, more energy in it than that of your cell phone. I know there was a lot of YouTube videos about the dangers of cell phones and things like that, but what well, the ambient light that we are subject to is actually more dangerous than that. Uh, granted, on the cell phone, uh, as long as you're talking, and if you're talking a lot, you're going to be exposed to a more intensive waves of that form. But the same thing, if you go outside or if you have your window open and if you're not in a dark room, you're also exposed to far more energetic wavelengths. So, uh, far more energetic uh, waves than that. So, I don't know. Honestly, I'm suspicious of those uh, those YouTube uh, postings. Anyway, here is the expression also that relates frequency. I'm going to use the letter F in here because I think it's probably easier. The energy and the frequency are related to one another. H is just a number. H is just a constant, which is 6.6. .6. 3 times 10 to the negative 34. And this is a unit, uh, unit of action, which is a joule times second. So in this case, this, 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 uh, this number is a very tiny number, granted. But the point being in here, energy and frequency go hand in hand, meaning higher frequency, more energy. That's exactly what I was trying to say in here with the cell phone. So the cell phone uses lower frequ less frequency, lower frequency, than that of the visible light. So it has less energy. That's the point I was trying to argue earlier about the energy for light. So this number in here is fixed. It's never changed. This is a constant. This is one of the constants of the universe. So you're wondering, where is that coming from? Well, uh, its roots are actually a little bit complicated outside of the scope of this one. It came in terms of a study by Mr. Planck of something called the black body radiation, which is something that we're actually needing down the road into how much energy is produ produced by, uh, by, uh, by uh, a given material depending on the wavelength that is uh, emitting. So that's basically the concept, okay? And in doing so, he noted that actually the energy of light comes in a discrete numbers, okay? Always comes in discrete numbers and it comes in chunks and these chunks are always coming this number h coming before them he didn't call it Planck's constant it would have been really bad taste to call something after he discovered it okay uh, uh, it was called after him later on he, he actually found another constant also called Boltzmann constant because he called it so but it was really actually him who, called, who found it but it was related to the work of Mr. Boltzmann. So later on, it was named, uh, the name stuck because he's the one who gave it the name uh, Boltzmann. But later on, people recognized also his contribution to this one. It's actually Mr. Einstein is the one who popularized the work of uh, Planck. And uh, this number came in and became known as Planck's concept. So it's just a fixed number. And it's one of the numbers of the nature, OK? And it sets a lower limit for everything like size, time, everything, okay? So this is one of the consequences and it's gonna come in handy down the road when we study the, the, the history of the, the universe, how the universe came to be from the moment of the Big Bang up to this current time where we are. And this same constant, Planck's constant would come in handy in there to explain the, the, the time before time, basically the time before 10 to the negative 34 uh, uh, seconds. And that time is a puzzle right now. Nobody understands it. We cannot understand it. And that is known as the Planck Epoch. And that is the time that's basically we have no clue and we cannot know anything about it. 
because time actually also is discrete. It comes in chunks of uh, time, bits of time. Anything less than that time, we don't know what it is, okay? So it's not a continuous. So I know the clock is ticking right now. It's what, 2.55, we've been in here for almost 50 minutes or so. And, uh, uh, and it looks like it's continuous, okay, who will search it from there, but it's not, it's actually a discrete thing. So again, the main point in here is energy of a light is proportional to the frequency. Barring a constant, which is really a scaling constant, these two are the same. So energy of light and the frequency of light are the same in terms of their effect. However, conceptually, they are different. Conceptually, the frequency is how many oscillations per unit time, how many oscillations in one second light does, goes up and down, up and down, up and down. The number I put earlier for the case of the cell phone, it's about uh, 1 billion oscillations per second. That's what that means. So by the time one second lapsed, that light went up and down, up and down, changing in magnitude a billion times more than that. If you're wondering what happened to the light to of, uh, the, the red light, well, that's 100,000 more than the other one in one second. It goes up and down, up and down, a ridiculous amount of, of time. So that is basically why these two are actually, uh, and then the energy, the energy is how much basically you're, 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 you're outputting in there. They are connected, the two are connected, okay? It's not the intensity, the energy of light is not its intensity, which is, which is another concept that I didn't mention extensively in here, because it doesn't really play a role when it comes to this issue. Namely, you could have, did I have my flashlight in here? Here it is, okay? You could have a flashlight in here on one mode or lower mode, okay? It's the same light. So basically the amount of light produced Depends, I'm trying to turn it off. <laughs> it's it's going through the full cycle to turn it off. The point being here is light uh, can have, can you can have a flood. Basically, a lot of light being produced or a less amount of light being produced. In terms of energy, in terms of the photoelectric effect, for example, it doesn't matter. All that matters is the frequency. Are we talking about very, very high frequency? We're talking about a low frequency. If the frequency of light does not exceed a certain threshold, you will never have photoelectric effect. To extract a single electron from an atom of a metal, you need to exceed its threshold frequency. And that threshold frequency is called the work function. So if you don't have that, you cannot extract an electron from it. No matter how much light you output, even if you come with all of the light of the world, as long as the frequency of that light is less than the threshold, forget about it. Okay, it's not going to work. So that's really the, the, the point I'm trying to make here. So energy and frequency are the same. Okay, again, light, the white light that you see in here, okay, this is the experiment of Mr. Newton, can be separated into different frequencies, okay? Can be separated into different frequencies using the prism, for example, in this case or using a device similar to, do I have it in here? The traction gradient for those of you sitting in my class at 125, the one for the lab, we did the diffraction gradient. I'm trying to see if I have one in here. And I think I have one somewhere. I bought it from uh, Amazon a long time ago and it's floating somewhere. I couldn't find it now. So the point being in here is you could have a, a, a separate the light into different components. Like in this case, you see the entire spectrum. And it goes from wavelength, from longest to shortest. So it's all of it in the same range in here. And in this experiment in here, what you do, you do, you use a converging lens. So the light in here diverges from the prism into different wavelengths. 
And then you use a converting lens as a converting lens in here and put it on the focal point. The focal point, the light that we're going to emerge, now it's back to white. So that proves that white light is nothing but the combination of all of the other different uh, frequencies. And this is actually handy in the, in the so-called, so uh, uh, and for example, in painting. Okay, so if you want to bring different kinds of frequencies, you can actually uh, mix different uh, colors and you will get uh, the desired uh, color. Okay, here is what I was talking about earlier okay, in terms of gamma rays, in terms of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so you have the gamma rays that are extremely short rays, then you have the X rays, and then you have the Ultraviolet, the CAT scan is somewhere in here, okay, in this range. So the ultraviolet, and then the visible light, the entire visible light spanning from the violet all the way to the red is this narrow band. And then you have the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the infrared, where your remote TV, TV remote control works, okay. And some of the remote controls actually they use the red light. But most of them, they use a color that you don't see. And then you have the infrared and their thermal imager. That's for the goggles, you know, that's used for night vision for uh, hunters and things like that. And then you have the microwaves. And uh, then the TV uh, FM, uh, frequency modulated, basically TV signals or uh, radio signals in general. And then the amplitude mod modulation AM uh, signal. Okay. So this is basically the different kind of spectrum in terms of sources. You have gamma ray bursts. Those are some of the most violent uh, events in the universe that produce the gamma rays. Those are the most energetic. As you go on the blue line, this way it's more energy. See, it says increasing energy, okay? And then you have pulsars, which are kind of neutron stars that's been super fast in this case. And uh, this is how they produce the X-rays. In terms of this range in here is usually from the stars, like the sun. Okay, those are main sequence stars like ours, okay? including some of the reddish stars, like the uh, 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 brown dwarfs and even the red giants and things like that. They emit in these ranges. Uh, longer wavelengths, they are they involve extreme long distances. In this case, for example, interstellar clouds. Cosmic microwave background, that is actually CMB, is part of the, uh, the initial uh, light that was emitted by uh, the universe, okay, when it was formed. So the universe, and I know I mentioned it briefly about the uh, Planck epoch, after that it cooled down, but it stayed super hot. There is no light could not escape it whatsoever. The first light that escaped the universe was about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And that light, because it formed a long, long time ago, over 13 billion years ago, because of how the expansion of the universe is expanding, the frequency shifted. Instead of being in the visible or even the more violent frequencies, it shifted. And it shifted to the microwave region, meaning that basically that light in here, that is how, how then we're going to talk about the uh, Doppler effect and how the frequencies get shifted and things like that when things move. So this is basically how we what we have in here. So the CMB or the uh, cosmic microwave background is actually a relic of the time when the universe was formed. It tells us exactly how the universe looked like the moment it became visible. Okay. And then you have even longer wavelengths that involve longer distances, such as uh, active gal galaxies in this case, when they are in collisions and so on and so forth. And usually when you are in this range, basically you either have genuinely uh, long wavelength emitters, like for example, uh, uh, radio communications and things like that, or extremely shifted, uh, normally higher frequency, but now they get shifted to lower frequencies, longer wavelength, okay? The James Webb, for example, operates in this region. So events that happened billions of years ago, they get shifted from where they are supposed to be all the way to this region, and James Webb now is looking at them. So it's looking back into history. 
The Hubble telescope, on the other hand, operates mainly in the visible region. So it's really good for stuff that did not happen a long, long time ago. Even it may have happened, for example, far in the time, but it did not shift all the way back to the, uh, to the infrared. So it needs to be somewhere in the visible region, a little bit to the infrared, a little bit to the ultraviolet. Maybe that's where the Hubble telescope can be useful for us, okay? Some of the events are so violent though, and tremendous high frequency, despite of the shift in frequency, they did not shift much, relatively speaking, because of the fact that they are too violent. So this is basically uh, how the wavelengths are and how we use them and how they are separated and so on and so forth, okay? So this is basically a description of what I was talking about in here, except that it starts from the opposite. It starts, I started from low, I mean, short wavelengths all the way to long wavelength, meaning I started with the highest energetic wavelengths all the way to least energetic wavelengths. Uh, the notes in here starts the opposite direction. It starts from the longest wavelengths down to the shortest wavelengths, namely from the lowest energetic wavelengths all the way to the highest energetic wavelengths. So that's what you see one and two in here. So again, depending on what we have, depending on the uh, frequencies that we're using, the universe looks completely different. So in the X-ray emissions, you're gonna be focused only on the X-ray emitters in your object that produce a lot of X-rays are visible. Anything else is not that visible, okay? And the shape of the galaxy would look completely different depending on the wavelengths that you're emitting because now you're focusing only on those objects that emit those frequencies, okay? So this is Andromeda and this is how it looks like with different fre frequencies, okay? Different, so this is in uh, six centimeters, that's a radio waves that you're, remember that's your uh, cell phone, okay? <laughs> that, that's in the radio waves and uh, 70 to 250 micrometers. It's still infrared actually, it's still not visible. The visible is between 400 and 70. That's how you see it if you go outside and look at it at night. This is how uh, 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 James Webb will render it, okay? And now with even shorter wavelength for the ultraviolet, it's going to look different with these emitters and the X-ray is going to mainly focus on the center where there's a lot of activity in there because stars are very close from one another. As a matter of fact, very close from the black hole, the central black hole of the galaxy. And those are highly emitting, high, extreme high energy frequencies. So that's basically uh, the notes for today. I don't think honestly that we could get into the, uh, the next chapter without running out of time. So let me quickly check the note from it and share it with you guys and see what kind of discussions we will have. And then uh, when we meet on Thursday, share, what is it, share? Unit 23. So in this case in here, we're going to define the black body and explain how the color lightness of thermal emissions, brightness of thermal emissions from an object depends on its temperature. For those sitting in, in astronomy 125, that was actually a very useful uh, expression that we had to find at the end because we correlated something called the lambda max and the temperature to a constant in here. And this is what is known as Wien, uh, Wien's law, okay? Then also we didn't, I don't think we did, but there is a Stefan Boltzmann law that tells you how much basically power is being emitted and it has a constant times temperature to the power four. So it's just a number, just like uh, your constant earlier of H, okay? So what the next chapter is gonna do is, here is the deal, okay? The next unit. If you look at an object, like tonight when you go outside and look at the stars, you will see stars that are bluish in color, others that are reddish in color and in between them. The blue ones, because their lambda max is in the blue range and the blue range is actually shorter wavelengths than the reddish ones, their temperatures are higher. So they have higher temperature than that of the reddish stars. If you look at Betelgeuse, for example, it looks reddish. So its surface temperature is a lot less than, for example, Rigel, which appears bluish color. 
So if you go tonight and look at these two stars, you're going to see a distinction in, with your own eyes. Obviously, that is not precise measurements. I'm just describing them. With the with 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 the spectrometer, for example, we can fine tune the frequency until we find exactly where the maximum frequency is. Once we find the maximum frequency, in other words, what red is red, because it's not all red is the same red. Different kind, of, different uh, flavor, different kind of intensities of red, if you wish. So in this case, uh, if we're doing beetle juice, we're going to find exactly what red it is. Then we're going to find what its surface temperature is. So did I go to uh, beetle juice and take a thermometer with me and measure the temperature? No, I did not. Nobody did. Nobody will. But just by looking at its color, finding the maximum color, OK? And the same tone in here for the other stars. So we can find the temperature. Once we find the temperature, we can tell how much light it's producing. What is the power output of that star? That's really fascinating. Without having setting foot on a given star, we can tell how much power it's, it's emitting. And that, if we know it, we will know how far the star is. It's really amazing, honestly. <laughs> Without leaving our seats, just by making measurements of frequencies, measuring, making stuff like that, and making measurements of intensities and things like that, we can know a lot about the star. We can know its surface temperature and how far it is and how big it is. And how old it is. And we can describe all kinds of properties of it. So this is the power of this unit. It is extremely powerful unit that is coming on Thursday. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time in it because this is the essence of astronomy. This is what astronomers nowadays do. I mean, granted at times there will be kind of a ambiguity about exactly where am I supposed to have put the number here or there, but at the end of the day, that is the struggle that they deal with on a daily basis, trying to determine all kinds of properties, histories, composition, uh, densities, all kinds of things just from these things, okay? Does this sound exciting to you guys? Okay, very good. Thank you. So again, I'll see you guys on Thursday, same time, same place. And I'll post this recording immediately after it became available, becomes available. Thank you.